So we're interviewing here today. I'm, I'm Peter Bothwell from Yelling Up, and uh, we're interviewing uh, Jack Jack Medlin Surfer, uh, who's also the proprietor and uh, developer of uh, Moonshine Moonshine Studio surfboards and longboards. And we just like asking a few questions about where he comes from and, and where he's going and all that sort of stuff. Okay, well. You know, obviously, uh, we're great fans of you know, your surfing and, and how you've sort of developed with your Moonshine sh uh, Studio to make boards. Um, so we'd just like to ask you a few questions. But in a previous conversation we had, you talked about how you you work with Ross Rutherford, mm -hmm. and maybe you could give us a bit of an insight of what that was like as a young person and how that maybe develop your surfing or your uh, thinking about longboards yeah. and whether that played a mentoring role and how, how you developed from there. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, I guess grew up sort of northern suburbs there around Scarborough, a bit further north in Marmion. Um, I grew up surfing shortboards predominantly and then uh, just I think it was year six or seven I had this dream to work in a surf shop so I went around to Ross's shop and asked if he could teach us how to fix things if we swept the floors. So it sort of all stemmed from there. What was Ross's brand? Uh, it used to be Scarborough Longboards initially, and then it sort of changed into Soul Board Store because he had a fair bit of crew coming in, okay. not knowing that he was had all types of boards in there. But yeah, predominantly uh, Longboards initially. Um, and yeah, one day I rocked up to, he got me doing the Saturday morning three hour shift and one, one day I rocked up and he'd made me this 9-1 or 9-2, sort of like a hybrid longboard with a sharp edge, so it's quite easy to turn. And um, that's sort of where it all started. I was sort of pretty, pretty well hooked from there and I think that would have been, I don't know, maybe 2013, 2013. Something like that, yeah. And um, there was a few other people working at the shop at the time, like Nathan and Matt Wynn, who were right into the longboarding. So um, I sort of, I guess, really inspired by the guys, um, not only at the shop, but the, um, the scene around the shop too. So yeah, they sort of took me under their wing and, and showed me the ropes. And I was sort of... Was there a longboard group up at Marmion? Uh, not so much Marmion, and there's sort of like the Scarborough, Scarborough Longboarders and then the Cottesloe crew and I so, sort of slowly emerged into the Scarborough Wavewalkers they were called, um, which Ross was, used to be the president of I think. Okay. Um, and yeah, we sort of started doing all the state titles. I think my first Aussie titles, I was surfing as a junior, or the first couple I wore I think. Um, and yeah, it sort of all stemmed from there. Did you surf that corner at Scarborough? I mean, Ross used to talk about riding that, that corner Maybe. up near, not Brighton, but sort of oh. in front of the steps there. Yeah, there was a few mysterious yeah. um, waves that Ross yeah. used to talk about. <laughs> and most of them sort of dissipated by the 90s, I think. <laughs> we always think that, you know, the spring big swells and sandbanks was the time to go there. Yeah. In our, in our day, anyway. But Tom yeah. Laxall blames those the rehabilitation of the sand dunes there for messing up the shape at Scarborough. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Seems there very straight these days. Definitely has its days. It definitely has its yeah. days, yeah. Well, um, the Brighton boys will swear by it. Yeah. But a longboard in those sort of fast breaking waves, yeah. you know, it's, it's not an easy place to learn. And I, I remember now though, there weren't a lot of really good surfers came out of Scarborough. Mm. There were more quite a slow and tricks and yeah. Like the city beach, so. yeah. Anyway. So, did he actually teach you to shape, Ross? Uh, he... he did. I learned. I learned a lot from Ross. He. I was sort of doing a lot of a lot of stuff in the backyard at the same time, and he, he initially started having me doing ding repairs, um, and then I I often asked him to shape me boards, and I would just sit in and watch him. So, yeah, he definitely taught me. Um, and demonstrated how to do it for sure and then down the track he started shaping boards for me and I would blast them and sand them 
Um, so that's probably where I started doing a bit more lamination and, and that sort of thing. Good finishing. First standing lamination, yeah. Um, but yeah, I was also working with Pete Dwyer at the time. He was shaping his boards out of his backyard in City Beach. Um, mainly, mainly shorter boards at the, t at the time. Um, so Pete taught me a lot at that stage too and he also went on to, to working down here at Injun Up at his folks place. We built a few sheds and we were, um, I was glassing a lot of his boards at the time and we, he was shaping and I was glassing and sanding and learned a lot from him too before I moved into Vaughn's workshop. Whose workshop? Uh, Vaughn's workshop where I am now so sort of Oh, actually, me and Pete shared a workshop in Aussie Park for a little bit, which was just like a storage unit. Um, but now you've got a studio. Yeah, well, yeah, I think we... That was actually prior. So we're at Injun Up, and then I think we come back to Aussie Park. And then I came back down to, to Vons in, in Vass there, okay. where I was glassing initially. For Vaughn, he probably taught me to sort of fine tune all my laminating skills and sanding skills. And um, now we who, now we share the workshop there. Who influenced you with your rails? Because the rails on your boards, the shapes are, are different to other people. Yeah. Somebody must have got to you. Well, I guess it's 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 sort of an influx of probably learning from from Ross and Pete having that West Australian influx, but also. I guess all my outlines come from mainly 60s long boards like this Len Divin here. Yep. Is the outline of, of these two in the middle here. Well, Lenny would be happy to hear that. <laughs> so I've sort of just modernised the rails a little bit and and the and the bottom it's not so modernised the rails or taken them back to what they were? Uh, they're, they're a bit more refined than these ones. Um, so I'm sort of, I guess I'm incorporating um, like a modern rail profile and the bottom contours as well and the outline from the old boards. So it's, yeah. They're working for you. Yeah. yeah, they certainly ride differently. And, mm. uh, and I think a lot of us uh, have forgotten how to ride them, you know, but I think I've certainly enjoyed riding mine. I reckon they're bloody great. Yeah, great. But the thing is about uh, competition, you sort of went, all of a sudden you, you went in those state rounds and how did you find I mean, you've obviously got some influences here, but I know what it's like when you go and compete in the East, it's a completely different ball game. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you, you require different sorts of boards, and you've got to adjust yeah. really quickly, and the natives aren't all that friendly to your... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, unless you can find somebody to mentor you there, like a, like Mitch apparently mentored a lot of people here. Yeah. Um, but we found that we became a bit of a tough breed. Yeah. You know, because we had to be... Uh, to compete against like the, the pros and the semi-pros and for sure and uh, how did you find that yeah it's not an um, easy thing you're definitely right because we'll we'll compete at waves like yelling up and sometimes bigger surf at ocean beach and they used to have around avalon as well mandra yep. that we've had some big days at so it's sort of you go from surfing anywhere from two to four to sometimes six foot at yows um, competing in that and then making the state team and surfing in the Aussie titles and we go back to surfing sort of knee height, Cabarita Point or <laughs> I've had a few at, uh, uh, what, at uh, Kings Cliff and I, I can't remember yeah. surfing yeah. any Aussie titles where it's over waist sort of shoulder height so yeah. you really have to have I the guess equipment. adjust and those boys pushing you up because they practice in those conditions all the time. Yeah, it's different from yeah from for sure. Up. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of people I think will probably find that a lot of WA longboarders surf really well off the tail, um, and are still sort of I guess not behind, but we're sort of used to nose riding in critical sections as opposed to like the softer point breaks and. Yeah. And that sort of thing, so we're not as. We've got time to set it up in those long. Yeah, we're situations. not as sort of in tune with like really sitting on the nose, and our boards aren't really designed for it either, so. Yeah. You seem to find good waves around here, but does it mean you get up early, or have you got a mole around here somewhere that tells you when it's breaking or where? Because <laughs> <laughs> quite often I find you at places before anyone else. Uh, I think we sort of 
sort of Hawkeye all the all the live is charts nowadays and yeah. um, oh, I hear reports. <laughs> hear reports, yeah, yeah, there's a few people looking around as well, but I guess when you're a surfboard shaper you can pretty well stop what you're doing and, and start to pick it up later on. You're not really locked into any yeah. full days of work or so that's the beauty of it. It's part of the lifestyle. Yeah. Research and development. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, so where do you think you want to take the Moonshine Studio concept <coughs> and, and, and boards in the future? I mean, there's su such a wide range of surfboard shapes that we can ride these days, and there's such a lot of information out there. Yeah, and uh, you have a fairly grounded sort of history, and then established sort of direction now, but where does, where does Moonshine do you think we're going to go? Um, I think my goal would be to have set up set up a workshop which is sort of not only where I make the boards but where we might be able to meet up and congregate with a, with a group of people and maybe have a bit of a retail space out the front um, so I can have sort of a display of my boards and and just like a clean, I guess like a, yeah, like a studio or a uh, like a raw workshop sort of thing where everything can be nicely displayed and, and um, I can make mine, the boards out the back. Yell mail and a few opportunities like that. You yeah. haven't got anywhere to display them down here. In yeah, the, in I mean, the like, yeah, we've got like we stock a few at the board store and um, it's the, the hardest part is getting making enough stock for it all to be there because I'm sort of quite often working through custom orders. Yes. So it's hard to sort of get in front and have stock sitting there ready to go. Um, so that's that's probably a big thing that I'd have in the future is hopefully have um, some people helping me out. Like I've had Evan, Evan helping me on the sander, which by itself is just yeah. being able to release the workload a little bit yeah. and be able to catch up with everything a bit easier. Yeah, I know some of the great uh, surfer shapers Guys like Ryan Birch and stuff like that, who you know, does all the test and development of his own product, but he does that. He'll, he'll make four or five, and he'll put them in a shop, and he'll and they they all look very fantastic yeah. to look at, and they just go yeah. like that, you know. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's a matter of having the resources, I suppose, to do that, or, sure. or, or an outlet. Yeah. But that, that studio concept is a good one. Yeah. To transport transport that to retail. That would be really interesting. Yeah. And I mean, it's sort of sort of baby steps at this stage because it does. It's it's quite a bit like a fair investment to set it all up to be able to work comfortably in it. Um, you know, you got to have your extraction and, and and all your bays set up with the lighting um, and all the other different bits and pieces that comes along with it. But yeah, I guess it's what what's good is where I am at the moment is I'm sort of. Can come and go as I please. I'm not really locked into a big long lease or rent or anything. No. So you've got a good lifestyle. Yeah, with the lifestyle side of it. Uh, what about all your cars too? <laughs> Are you, you're into old surfboards, vintage surfboards, and yeah. vintage cars. Where did you get the, the cars from? Well, they come with the board. <laughs> not quite. Yeah. Um, I started started getting into cars. I guess I sort of just fell in love with the culture that came around it and um, from the 60s yeah, yeah sort of 60s culture so I always wanted a Holden um, but I realized that gaining in value and price so I managed to get my hands on an old Toyota Crown um, and I actually went up went on to start doing some panel beating work with him out in Midland um, and I nearly went on to starting a well I did start like a pre-apprenticeship um, in in light vehicle mechanics, mm. and I was sort of had a little sidetrack to maybe start working on cars, but I realised that that was sort of just a hobby for me. I didn't want to do that as a job. So okay. it's in your blood. Yeah, but that's where I got the car from. I, the guy I bought it off had a workshop, and I did a bit of work with him for three months or so um, out good. at Blue Dog Garage. Um, but yeah, I've slowly been tinkering with it over the years, and it's. Just out the front here, it's been resting for a while, but... Well, Toyota Crown's probably better than any Holden anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> probably, probably more reliable. reliable. 
Yeah. But uh, the, all the cars we had, we always had somebody in our group that was a like a car buff surfer. Yeah. We could fix them all to keep them, keep it all going, you know, <laughs> because we were hopeless. Good hopeless friend friends. to have. Yeah. There was always somebody who could do it, you know. I was looking at a video the other day, I think Lockie did a few blokes driving back from a surf. You must have taken it from the back seat, you two oh, yeah. blokes sitting there in the front driving. Oh yeah, it's yeah. It's good photography, that was good. Ask him how he got the upholstery done. <laughs> oh, the upholstery? Yeah. Um, I met one of the guys from, he was actually uh, around the WA scene for a while, Gary, Gary McCormick. Yeah. And yes. he, um, yes, yes. He worked at the Balga Tape doing upholstery and teaching upholstery. We were actually surfing uh, over east, surfing Crescent Head actually, had a really good surf. We were all in the car park having a beer and I bumped into Gary and we just got talking and he was saying he's looking for a project for his kids at the Tape to do. And I said, oh well the, the seats are rooted in my crown and probably needs a good spruce up. And he said, yeah, fantastic. And I think I paid him material price, like three or four hundred bucks. And he did all the door cards, all the seats, all the boot lining. He even made me a uh, bag for my jack out of the same grey interior. That's good. That's good, you um, here. So, yeah, there was a few. And also, I've just had the paint redone um, through Terry Goddard's workshop up in Perth. So, another connection through the Longboard Club. That's good. His, one of his work is... Um, yeah, re-sprayed it all this, all the same colour. You can always find a car freak in surfing somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I don't know where our man's gone, but I, I don't really have much else. But I am also interested in the, in the way you actually ride a surfboard, you know, like how, I mean, you, you're quick to get into the hook and ride the nose, you know, you know, just sort of, just like that, you know. It's not an easy thing to do. Mm. Uh, I know I can't do anything on a long board without pretty much setting it up. I can't <laughs> just jump up there and jump back and do all that sort of stuff. So, and to do it with style, I was talking to somebody today about the Margaret River, River uh, you know, young good surfers, and, and they have a history of style too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jacob Wilcox, he's watch him surf, he, it's, it's all pre precision, but it's uh, embedded in that as a style that's sort of generational. Yeah. And uh, you know it's fantastic to watch. And, I don't know how does style figure into your. Uh, um, it's is, always. Is it innate, or you have to concentrate? What's that? Is it innate? It's inside you, or you have to concentrate? Oh, uh, I mean, I think growing up, I was always conscious of of what I look like surfing. But I think there's, I think it's something you can't really fight. I think everyone's got their own style. You can pretend to look like someone else, but you're always. You're just going to have your own thing happening, so I guess it probably develops from where you've been surfing and what you've been surfing. So probably, probably learning to surf bigger boards in more powerful ways, like yelling up and, and just having to put, put the board in the right part of the wave. And I guess it's probably not styles, probably not actually doing each manoeuvre. It's what probably what joins it all together. Um, Getting in that critical spot. So yeah, yeah, I think that's probably where it all comes from. Okay, we we're right, boys. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for the chat, Jack. That's yeah, good. no. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Thanks Lockie. Cheers. Cheers.